The main projectile here is a flathead ballistic capped shell with a hefty load of explosives, almost 250 grams of TNT equivalent. Pair this gun with these shells and you have enough to send any enemy to the hangar with a single shot. But everything comes at a price. If you miss, you might not get another chance. This wonder gun has a very long reload time, which means aim. Fortunately, it's not going to be an issue. The IS is pretty mobile for a heavy tank. More than that, it's unusually quick in reverse for Soviet tanks, which is often used for a unique fighting style known as the Ferdinand style. The trick is simple. Turn your hull 180 degrees before the battle and advance with your rear. It's armored well enough to handle some hits when angled, and if the incoming projectile does penetrate the armor, the engine compartment will soak up the shrapnel. It still means damage to the machine, but much less than getting hit into the combat compartment full of crew, ammo, and fuel. To make penetration even harder for your enemy, we suggest that you try angling your hull and rotating your turret before an expected hit. That makes it much harder to aim for vulnerabilities on your curved, angled armor. Thanks to the powerful gun, a high level of mobility, and a good level of protection, this Soviet tank can perform various roles on the battlefield depending on what the situation requires. It can be both a support machine that hits the most dangerous enemies and hides for a reload, or an advancing machine, going through enemy defenses and taking a few hits on its own. All of this is also true for later IS-2 1944 machines, a family recently reinforced with a new event vehicle. They have a higher battle rating, but their frontal armor is significantly stronger. The vulnerable lower front plate is still there though, so it still makes sense to turn your back on the enemy even on those later modifications. As for the gun, well, it doesn't care what tanks to shoot at. You might need to aim for vulnerabilities on some extra heavy foes, but they're still guaranteed to see the hangar after penetration. The Catalina, an ingenious creation of Isaac Ladin, shook the U.S. aircraft market in the mid-1930s. It was selling like hotcakes, both among civilians and Navy clients. And this was only the beginning. Even the Catalina's creator himself had no idea how successful it was to become. A peaceful and honest person, Ladin was probably very happy to go down in history as a peacemaking aviation engineer, the designer of an aircraft that connected the skies, the ground, and the water, consolidated and made a difference. In fact, saved people. Even the name of Ladin's employer was fitting for that kind of work, consolidated. Meanwhile, humanity was steaming off towards a new major war. The U.S. Air Force was planning a big rearmament, and the bosses at Consolidated decided to take part in the competition to build a new strategic bomber. The only problem they had was their main engineer. Ladin had no desire to create a killer plane. What could they do? Entice him. First introduce him to another genius. His name was Dave Davis, and he'd proposed a revolutionary aerodynamic wing profile. This amazing high aspect ratio wing would be installed onto the future B-24 and help it achieve a speed and range simply phenomenal for the time. Moreover, they could put off the engineer's guard by presenting the project as a multi-purpose plane. You know, it'll never be mass produced, and if they do use it as a bomber, it would only be as an addition to the already existing mass produced B-17. Of course, Isaac Ladin was far from naive. He knew exactly what he was creating. But he also couldn't sabotage his own work or do it poorly. Even when creating a plane he didn't like, he made a masterpiece. Maybe he'd actually hoped things would come right. For some reason or another, the project may never hit mass production and would never become recognizable. We'd never know. What we do know, though, is this. When the prototype was first tested in the spring of 1939, the military was so happy that they commissioned no less than 6,000 of these planes. More so, they doubled down when the war broke out in Europe. As it blazed up, 
Douglas and North American companies joined the construction of the Liberators. More than that, the Ford Company, who had only some indirect ties to aviation previously, even built an enormous production center for the B-24, capable of assembling a fully capable bomber every hour. 24 planes a day. That's a whole regiment of heavy bombers. So yes, the B-24 went on to become the most mass-produced piston-engined strategic bomber in history. Official figures alone show that no less than 18,482 of them were built. It was a world record, and Isaac Ladin's name could have been lettered in gold in the history books, but he wanted nothing of the sort. The realization of what monster he'd unleashed onto the world must have hit him so hard that it broke him, and Ladin never made another notable aircraft again. Consolidated would soon lose competition to Boeing with its famous B-29 and even lose its own name after merging with Vultee Aircraft into Convair. As for Ladin, he later played some background roles in designing jet airliners and refused to take part in any military projects. Aged too soon, he was often seen at air shows next to his beloved Catalinas, but never around the B-24. Every time you recall Isaac Ladin today, remember that he considered the Catalina his main achievement. It was this sound, peaceful machine that he was proud of not the perfect tool of war. We've recently talked about tank crews and discussed the best ways of improving them to achieve maximum battle efficiency. And today we'd like to focus our attention on the skills of pilots and service personnel. You can gain aircraft crew points the same way as for tank crews, so there's not much use in going over it again. Crew points directly depend on the research points you gain in battle, and you can boost it for Golden Eagles. To achieve the maximum skill level of an aircraft crew, you need 33,381 points. The training menu has three tabs, Pilot, Defensive Armament, and Logistical Services. We'll start with the first one, where all the pilot skills can be found. Vitality is the one we'd like to talk about first here. At the lowest levels, the pilot can survive a single small caliber round or a similar shrapnel wound. A trained pilot can even sustain a large caliber round hit with some luck. Pilot vitality is essential for any aircraft crew. Bombers need it to survive interceptor attacks, attack aircraft need it to sustain ground anti-aircraft fire, and fighters need it for successful frontal attacks. Speaking of fighter pilots, their next most important skills are G-tolerance and stamina. We recommend you train these equally. The former, as you might have guessed, affects the worst positive or negative G-loads a pilot can sustain while performing a sharp maneuver. The latter affects the maximum duration of above-tolerance loads a pilot can sustain and the recovery time required for a pilot who did lose consciousness due to overload. Next, we have the skills affecting enemy detection, keen vision, and awareness. The better they are, the further a pilot can spot enemies or missile launches in modes with markers. Many aircraft, though, have crews of more than a single pilot, so let's see what we've got in the Defensive Armament tab. Some of these are already familiar, such as Vitality, Stamina, and G-Tolerance. Since aircraft with defensive turrets don't often join high-energy dogfights, the truly important skill here is Vitality. Gunners are constantly under fire. It's their job, after all. If you don't like taking manual control over turrets, take a look at fire precision and accuracy. Upgrading these will improve the distance at which your gunners start firing and, more importantly, help them score a few hits. Now, the last point here is the number of experienced gunners. If you point your cursor at it, you can see how many gunners your aircraft has, and there's no use in upgrading the skill any further since, unfortunately, it won't add any more turrets anyways. The more experienced gunners you have, the more successful their firing will be. But no matter how experienced the gunners or the entire crew is, players always score better. So when you can, switch to manual control to significantly improve your chances. The last tab here, the Logistical Services, has some skills you might remember from our previous video, Repair Speed and Repair Rank. These affect the repair speed in the hangar, on the airfield, and in port. 
we should note that these skills are shared between all kinds of vehicles a cruise mechanics can fix. Meaning, if you upgrade this for tanks, you won't have to do it again for aircraft. But aircraft also expect a higher qualification from the crew, so their logistical services tab has a couple of unique traits. Reload speed affects the time required to restock your ammo on the airfield, or mid-air if you're playing arcade. It's pretty useful, but has almost no effect on battle efficiency. Now, weapon maintenance is basically the opposite. Upgrading this skill will reduce bomb and rocket spread, which is great for assault, and decrease the chance of weapon jamming, which means longer continuous fire for you. Well, that's it. Use your knowledge well and train your crews. Meanwhile, we'll answer some of the questions you ask us in the comments. The first question was sent by a player called Fusion Chicken. Why do all the Soviet jets have so few bullets for their cannons? Hey there, your question made us think. Why don't we dedicate a whole Pages of History section to it? There's a lot to tell there, so you'll see it in one of our episodes. Mersak asks, uh, Hey, in the aircraft control settings, there are options for horizontal and vertical radar slash IRST target Q control axis. When I mapped and tested them, I didn't see any effect on my radar display or search zones. What are these options supposed to do? And what aircraft can use them? Hi, Mersak. These settings are responsible for moving the target queue that chooses a target on your radar screen. They work on all vehicles with radar if you disable Target's Cyclic Switching of Aircraft Radar for aircraft or Target's Cyclic Switching of Ground Radar for AA vehicles and vessels. Another question comes from 777GL1. What's the difference between the two rocket types from the German Wiesel II Ocelot AA tank? Hey there! The upgradable missile, Modification K, has a proximity fuse, which improves its battle efficiency. Skipper N10 writes, Do APS systems work behind smoke? Hi, Skipper. That's a good question. Active protection systems use radar to detect threats, and no smoke ever stopped them. And the last comment for today was written by Type 5 Hori. I'd really like to see a rocket interceptor triathlon. Can you do one? Hello, Type 5. Nice idea, thanks, but we don't have enough participants to have a full triathlon. Let's have a small competition here instead and see who's quicker. Lining up at the start? Let's go. The Soviet vehicle breaks right off, leaving the others behind. At first, the German and the Japanese aircraft are going even, but the Comet soon overtakes its counterpart. Well, we guess the race is over. That's it for today. You've been watching The Shooting Range by Gaijin Entertainment, and the next episode will premiere the following Sunday at 4 p.m. GMT or noon Eastern Time. Subscribe and click the bell if you don't want to miss our next videos. Don't forget to leave a like, give your crews a good pep talk before battle, share your thoughts and comments, and see you next week. Last time we told you about Israeli armor that made it into the game with update Wind of Change. In this episode, let's talk about Israeli aircraft. The way to get access to them is exactly the same. You do it by unlocking any rank 4 aircraft from the British, the US, or the French tech tree, or by obtaining one of the Israeli premiums. As with ground vehicles, most aircraft employed by the Israeli Air Force were purchased from other countries, but Israeli engineers did a great job of improving and modifying those designs to make sure that they could achieve air superiority even when completely outnumbered. Today we're going to talk about the most interesting aircraft of the tech tree that are ready to challenge the best vehicles available to other nations. Let's kick it off with one of the very few piston engine aircraft of the tech tree, the Spitfire Mark 9 CW. This iconic fighter originally served in the UK where it played a critical role in preventing the German aircraft from invading Britain. Two 20mm Hispano cannons and two Browning machine guns can quickly take care of any enemy aircraft, including large bombers. 
At rank 5, you get to the first Israeli jet, a late variant of the Votour IIN bomber. It can carry up to 3.5 tons of bombs, but that's just the beginning. The main selling point of this bomber is that it's crazy fast and also armed with four 30mm DIFA cannons. The insane thrust-to-weight ratio of the aircraft allows it to easily outrun most of its smaller opponents and aggressively dictate the flow of battle. You also get a lot of ammo, which means that you can fire so much lead at your opponents that they won't be able to evade or withstand it. Did we mention that there's also a radar station allowing you to locate vulnerable targets with ease? Because there is one. Then we go up to rank 6, and here you simply have to take a look at the A4N. The original model was pretty great on its own, but the Israeli variant received an even more powerful engine, meaning that this model has even better flying characteristics. The plane is pretty maneuverable. It can win dogfights against many opponents at the same BR, even if they're faster than the A4N. The secret is that this strike aircraft can carry two AIM-9D missiles, or four Israeli-made Shafrir missiles. It also absolutely shines in mixed battles because of its large variety of mixed loadouts. You get the legendary AGM-65 Maverick, several smart bombs, and lots of regular bombs to pick from. At rank 6, there's also a very interesting fighter aircraft called the Sambad, which is a late version of the French Mystère. Thanks to its decent max speed and good maneuverability, the Sambad can fight really well against any of its contemporaries. And when it runs into newer, faster aircraft, it can still give them hell thanks to a good selection of air-to-air -air missiles and a couple of trusty 30mm cannons. This fighter also has some utility in mixed this fighter also has some utility in mixed battles, as it can eliminate a few tanks with bombs and guns. But you'd better get back to taking care of enemy aircraft as soon as you can. We go to the last rank and see the one and only F-4E Phantom, an almost perfect fighter bomber. It has Sparrow missiles that are excellent for seizing initiative at medium range, and in close combat, you can always rely on AIM-9P missiles. Due to its rather limited maneuverability, it has a hard time dogfighting any light fighters, but it's extremely effective at longer ranges. Furthermore, the Phantom can carry quite a lot of bombs, and it has access to many different payload options. Tankers beware! Finally, the apex predator of the whole tech tree is the Kfir C7, based on the French Dassault Mirage. Compared to the original model, it underwent a lot of changes and modifications, but you can still clearly see some of that Mirage DNA in the design. The idea was to create an effective fighter bomber, and that's why it can carry up to four tons of rockets, missiles, and bombs in different configurations. At first glance, its air-to-air -air capabilities are nowhere as impressive, as the aircraft only has access to relatively low-value, short-range air-to-air missiles. But the true strength of the Kfir C7 lies in its excellent thrust-to-weight ratio and great maneuverability, both of which can be attributed to its new engine. All of that makes this aircraft a fearsome opponent that can quickly force a dogfight and then make short work of any enemy that dares to fight it. All in all, the Israeli Air Force employed the best aircraft from different schools of aircraft design. From the incredibly fast Spitfire to the highly versatile Phantom, each of those aircraft was a true king of the skies. But what are your favorite planes from the Israeli roster? Tell us in the comments below. Welcome to Thunder Show and the best moments of the past week. How do we sum up this episode? Maybe you've got to see it to believe it. We'll have a BMP-2, a couple of MiGs, a nuclear carrier, and even a master mortar sheller who got a plane by mistake. Let's get started.
Today's first moment is another one from Reddit. A Moracker lost their tank but got something better instead, a nuke. All they need to do is make it in time because their team score is almost zero. The plane's taking off while the points are getting down. Flying over a forest, two of the three points are under enemy control. Getting close to the battlefield, just a couple pixels left of the blue stripe, and, and, gotcha. They win this round at the very last second of the battle. Now that's a true thriller. Star-Lord met a couple of BB-1s on their MiG-3 and swapped speed for altitude to get a good striking position. However, their chasers have more energy. Climbing well, maybe even too well. One of them crashes and drops the chase, while the other one gets into a volley of the fighter that got its nose down already. <laughs> what an amazing combo. We failed to figure out what Prosyashik tried to hit with their BMP-2M's grenade launcher, but the result is they managed to score a direct hit on an enemy Faka Wolf from a couple kilometers away. More than that, it was chasing an ally, Era Cobra. Have you ever seen such a fantastic hit with a weapon that's only good for scaring away birds? And here's a duel between two supersonic opponents, Donovan with their MiG-21 against the Swift Starfighter. The F-104 is luckier here, damaging a control service on the fish bed and sending it into a rapid spin. And then they swiftly join the hangar screen themselves. Let's see this one more time. The MiG-21 is spinning with almost no control, but manages to knock the enemy out with a single well-placed volley. It would have been okay on piston engine planes, but these guys' total speed was almost Mach 2. Where's our gold? Bring it in. Every pilot knows that you need guided bombs for toss bombing. Trying to pull it off with conventional ones only makes sense if you're the challenge editor in the shooting range. But look at that. Mika Kuta tosses their bombs along a very curious trajectory. They even managed to fly across the battlefield before their dangerous payload made a huge arch and landed right onto an enemy Leopard 2. My oh my, here's your gold. And as usual, our weekly award for live War Thunder works. Today, we'd like to reward Teo Storm 1 for this amazing true to life camo for the German Puma IFV. Again, who said cubism was an art? By the way, we see these comments saying it isn't fair to reward certain moments since it's obviously pure luck. Remember we had a poll about what you wanted to see more on Thunder Show? Your votes were around 50-50. Some of you wanted pure skills, while others wanted coincidences and lucky situations. We've heard you, and now we're choosing moments from all kinds of categories. Looking forward to new ones. Bye! The Shooting Rage In this episode... Pages of History, Elephants and Ferdinands, Special, Trying Out the New Weapon Loadout Menu, and Metal Beasts, The Double Chinese Fish Bed. Many pilots have first-hand knowledge of the MiG-21 fighter family. Fewer people are familiar with their Chinese versions. The J-7 Modification 2 is almost identical to its Soviet siblings, while the E version boasts a unique wing. But how about a double MiG? Surprisingly, that's the kind of task the Chinese aviation engineers once received. And here's what they made. The aircraft's power plant is two turbojet engines with afterburners. Self-sealing fuel tanks are found in the wing and the fuselage, while the nose cone hides a radar system. Fixed armament consists of a 23mm autocannon with an ammo pool of 200 rounds. The aircraft can also carry conventional bombs and rockets, as well as infrared and radar-guided air-to-air missiles. The key part of this machine is its power plant. 
Two engines provide a high thrust-to-weight ratio, which in turn means excellent dynamics and climb rates. And no one ever thought the regular MiG-21 had a shortage of it in the first place. The increase in power didn't affect the maximum speed, however. It's limited by the wing's capabilities, much like on its predecessors. We definitely wouldn't recommend accelerating past 1,360 km per hour near the ground unless you want to turn into a starfighter. Now, one might assume that adding another engine would make the aircraft big, heavy, or clumsy, like some Phantom. But it actually didn't. The increased size had little effect on maneuverability. The J-8 does a great job at turning towards the enemy, and you don't really need much more from a top fighter. It has two types of missiles against enemy air, the IR homing PL-5B for close range and the radar-guided USPIDA for long distances. Both do their jobs just as well as their counterparts from other nations. Now, the fixed armament of the J-8 leaves much to be desired. Its ammo pool can only last 3.5 seconds of continuous use, and with a low fire density, it's far from the best choice for gun duels. As for countermeasures, it's a mixed bag for this fighter. I mean, it does have some, which is already a matter of envy for some competitors. The Mirage, the Draken, the Starfighter, the Nesher, and the F-1 fighters can only have flares in front of their noses. But there are only 64 of them, and even despite their increased caliber, they might not last the entire battle. Close air support isn't the strongest role for this Chinese fighter. You can destroy tanks with its rockets and 500-pound bombs, but it's a tricky task without a ballistic computer. What the J-8 does great is clearing the skies of enemy aircraft, providing a major contribution towards victory and ensuring the safety of Allied vehicles. The Ferdinand self-propelled guns occupy a special place in the history of German armored vehicles. There are so many myths about their creation and battle engagement that these machines are no doubt legendary. They also had just as legendary a predecessor, the Porsche Tiger. By the way, many made-up stories and misconceptions accumulated around the wartime activities of the Porsche company. You can often hear that the SPG was actually the idea of Ferdinand Porsche himself. They'd say Porsche was making his Tiger for a competition, but lost to Henschel and decided to use the hulls for the SPGs. In fact, Porsche was only a design bureau back in those years, nothing else. Both Tigers were made according to official contracts, with Steyr factories assembling both Porsche Tiger and Ferdinand machines. No independent action was allowed in producing vehicles, of course. Due to urgency, the Germans put the Tigers into production with no preliminary testing, right off the blueprints. No wonder the first right off the blueprints. No wonder the first tanks had heaps of issues and assembly plans were shattered. The Porsche Tiger was the most notable issue producer. It had a new unique suspension, new air-cooled engines, and an electric transmission. Unlike other German tanks, it had rear-leading wheels, while pneumatic brakes were in the front. No one had any idea about their real-world performance. And soon, the number of issues became so overwhelming, they had to stop the assembly lines for Porsche Tigers. What could they do next? They could try to polish both Tigers, but didn't they have enough issues with just one? On the other hand, discarding an entire project would be a shame with so much time and effort spent. So, the Germans found a compromise. The Henschel Tiger would be mass-produced, while the Porsche Tiger designs would be used to create a self-propelled gun. It was still a complicated task that required new solutions, but Porsche engineers weren't new to bold experiments. The first thing they had to solve was the layout. The new, more powerful cannon had such a long barrel that they couldn't simply replace the turret with a casemate. The German army already had SPGs with a casemate in the rear and engines right below it. It made repairs difficult even with open-top compartment vehicles, so they had to find another solution for the Ferdinand. So the engines and the generators were placed in the center. Now only the casemate had to be removed to access the electric drives. The suspension units were outside so they could be replaced in the field, while the road wheels didn't overlap. 
The engineers were worried about their brainchild. They didn't have enough time to polish the Porsche Tiger, and yet they had more issues to work on. Could a 65-ton SPG be reliable? How do you tow and repair it? How would the electric transmission perform in 